Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. I'm Scott, and you're hearing my chat with Max Fox, editor of the late Christopher Chitty's book, Sexual Hegemony, Statecraft, Sodomy, and Capital in the Rise of the World System, published in 2020 by Duke University Press. Max Fox is an editor of Pinko Magazine, a former editor of The New Inquiry, and translator of Guy Okingem's novel, The Amphitheater of the Dead. You can find Max on Twitter at MXWFX. Christopher Chitty was a PhD candidate in the history of consciousness at the University of California, Santa Cruz. For the hour, we spoke about the failures of gay liberation, the connections between sexual identity, class, and the rise of the state, and how sexuality ties into current liberation movements. First up, here's a quick announcement from Certain Days Freedom for Political Prisoners Calendar Collective. More info on that can be found at certaindays.org. And they'll be releasing their 21st calendar this coming autumn. The 2022 theme is, quote, creating a new world in the shell of the old, unquote, and is looking at collective approaches at creating more inclusive and fulfilling worlds through mutual effort. They're looking for 12 pieces of art and 12 short essays to feature in the calendar, which hangs in more than 6,000 homes, workplaces, prison cells, and community spaces around the world. They're encouraging contributors to submit both new and existing work, and they especially seek submissions from people in jail or prison. So please forward this to any prison-based artists and writers. The deadline is June 14th. Um, There's information on the theme guides and uh, formatting and such available at their website certaindays.org and prisoner submissions are due july 1st 2021 and can be mailed to certain days care of burning books 420 connecticut street buffalo new york 14213 or if you're north of that pesky border certain days care of qpirg concordia 1455 de Massanouve, West, Montreal, Quebec, H3G, 1M8, Canada. To hear our past interviews with folks on certain days and learn more about the project, uh, check out our archives and we'll link it in the show notes in the mention of this call up for submissions. Incarcerated, indigenous, revolutionary, uh, bank robber, and all-around badass Oso Blanco has released a few greeting cards that he's designed. You can see them up at burningbooks.com, and if you look at the uh, look up Oso Blanco, and these go to benefit children's art projects. It's four cards with envelopes. They cost thirteen dollars as a bundle. If you don't know, Oso was imprisoned by the U.S. government for expropriating from banks to fund the Zapatista Army of National Liberation and has been using art to continue his mission. These first four designs were all painted by Oso Blanco after he was captured in 1999. Proceeds from the sale of the greeting cards will benefit children in the autonomous Zapatista zone of Chiapas, Mexico, and on reservations here on Turtle Island. You can learn more about where the funding is going by visiting schoolsforchiapas.org and you can learn more about Oso Blanco's case at freeosoblanco.blogspot.com We're talking today about sort of the current state of radical, anti-authoritarian, queer, liberatory movements and the legacy of gay liberation, you know, from the 60s and 70s in like gay history. Before we get into it, can you introduce yourself and the kind of work you've done? We're, we're talking about specifically Christopher Chitty's book and and sort of your placement within that. And if you want to say anything else about yourself and um, your pronouns, whatever you feel. Uh, sure. My name is Max Fox. You see him. I am the editor of this book that was written by Christopher Chitty. It's called Sexual Gemini. Statecraft, Sodomy, and Capital on the Rise of the World System. I'm also an editor at a gay communist magazine called Pinko. And I'm the translator of a short book by this French theorist named Guillaume Kenyon. 
called the amphitheater of the dead. Which is sort of, that's how we met, sharing an interest in Ockingham. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk at all about how you got involved in editing the Christopher Chitty's book and the project and, and how you, yeah, how your work re- relates to it? I knew Chris in, when I was in, in college at UC Santa Cruz. He was a graduate student in the history of consciousness department, which is this kind of fairly uh, unique critical theory, Marxist philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, style graduate program that I, as a young, enthusiastic leftist was like, wow, the, simply the coolest thing you could possibly be studying. And so I like tried to sit in on all these classes in that department, which is sort of one of the ways that I encountered him. But we, we met really we're organizing on this anti-austerity, anti-sort of tuition hike movement in, let's say, 2009, 2010, like right after the crash, that became the sort of Occupy, California Occupy DC system movement, which was sort of like a precursor to the Occupy Wall Street stuff. And so he was someone who I met in this, in this moment of kind of like intense you know, personal transformation, I suppose. And he was also working on this very incredible sounding theory that promised to, in my view, kind of revolutionize the understanding of history of sexuality, sexuality studies, grief theory, et cetera. And I was like very eager to have something like that because I felt kind of dissatisfied with a lot of the sort of sexual politics that were ready to hand at the time it was you know gay marriage moment and um i felt kind of unconvinced by a lot of the positions on both sides even and i wanted something more like whatever marxist or rigorous or something like that um you know and chris seemed to be working on precisely that and so i was very eager for him to finish his dissertation and sort of get that out in the world and so when he died and 2015, you know, I was personally very devastated and there was kind of attached that feeling to this thought that like the work wouldn't be finished. And that was something that I could actually sort of put some efforts towards. And so I, I didn't really think it was gonna be such a long project, but I sort of uh, assumed the responsibility of collecting his sort of the draft material that his family and his friends had access to and finding a publisher and, you know, getting it through the revision process and things like that. And now kind of like seeing it through the, the publicity end or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, it was like this, you know, I had, I had an intense like intellectual response to this. I, I wouldn't have done it. I don't think um, if I didn't think it was worth thinking about or thinking with, but obviously there's a pretty significant like emotional component as well for me. So, Yeah. Thanks for sharing that history that you have like connected with Chris Chitty. And I mean, yeah, it, it is, I think you're, you were right back then to say that like the work is like going to make a giant contribution. I've, I've felt reading this, that it has really um, affected my way of thinking and also responded to some of my own frustrations but also I want to like, yeah, acknowledge that kind of like personal grief work there that was, must have been part of your editing, but you like brought this thing out, which I think is super important. And if you're ready, we kind of move into some of these ideas, then like tease them out a little bit. So in your foreword to the book, you summarize the project as, I'm quoting you, an attempt to think through the failure of sexual liberation by what Chitty described as the returning the history of sexuality to a history of property. And like, we could talk about that as kind of combining his readings of Marx and Foucault as you do. And like, there's, that's a whole debate within queer theory. But uh, I was wondering if you could sort of explain this argument that the way that you sum it up, how would you articulate the relationship that he explores in the book between same sex practices, particularly sodomy, um, sex between men, and the development of the bourgeois state and how has the figure of the homosexual or homosexuality helped consolidate the state? Yeah. Okay. So he, one of the tricky things about this book, I think is that he's making two slightly different claims they're obviously related, but the relation between them is maybe a little underspecified. 
he is saying that there's a way of grasping power that falls under the name of sexual hegemony, which is basically how a ruling class comes to install its particular sexual practices and norms in the intimate self-conception of members of classes that don't occupy the same position in that society. So that's sexual hegemony. And then secondly, he's saying that the figure of male homosexuality kind of illuminates the particular history of how in capitalist society, sexual hegemony is an integral part of bourgeois rule or rule of capital sexual relations. And he's telling a story about how in the earliest sort of capitalist societies and the earliest spaces in the world that you could plausibly claim are governed by capitalist relations production, which he, following this economic uh, historian Giovanni Arrighi, locates in the northern Italian city-states in the 1400s or so, Florence and Venice uh, in particular. He says that, well, okay, so first of all, in the Mediterranean basin, there is, in this moment, there's a basically widespread and unremarkable just fact of men having sex with men. It's just simply, it's not, it doesn't have its own name necessarily. It's not, so that doesn't give you a, 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 a sort of unique social status because it's so ordinary, you know, sort of re- basically relations of production, you know, apprenticeships and seclusion of women in the household and even, you know, things like the type of ships that they use. All of this basically contributes to a public sphere that is exclusively male, essentially, where men and women don't have any uh, access to each other except for within their own family. So, so that's kind of prohibited by the incest ban, the sex between these people. And so the only kind of sexuality you're going to have if you're a man is with other men who you will encounter, you know, on the docks or in the marketplaces or in your uh, workplace or in the cruising areas and the, and the taverns and whatever. Um, and that's, that's simply what you do. It's not, a, it doesn't give you an identity or whatever. Yeah. And so he's saying that, you know, around the same time that capitalist relations production begin to take hold, there's also a new form of Republican governance where the laws of the city have some shared source of legitimacy. And it's not just in kind of, feudal lord or whatever, but there's some attempt at reviving a kind of like civic base of power. And that then obviously kind of comes into conflict with the actual disparate levels of power that people have. There are more powerful rich people, less powerful working people. And so you need a way of managing this conflict that doesn't end up um, expressing itself in overthrowing this new form of government and installing rule of the many who are poor uh, instead of the few who want to have the legitimacy of consent or whatever. Anyway, sorry, that's, that's a bit of an aside. Um, the point is that these governments start adopting a new way of enforcing or regulating sodomy, um, which, as I said before, wasn't really a sort of serious problem. But there are problems, obviously, when you have disputes between lovers or disputes between clients and uh, patrons, right? Um, and so instead of, you know, punishing sodomites with uh, capital punishment, which was maybe, you know, a, a, a scary threat in the past, but wasn't ever actually applied very often, what these governments do is they start a special police force that is just there to investigate accusations and issue fines, basically. And so what this does is it incentivizes people to inform on each other. If you're like mad that your ex is going out with your you know, a rival, then you can call the police about it and say, these two sodomites, I saw them in the loggia the other night and 
you should go find them 24 ends or whatever, you know, or, you know, you're a sex worker and your John doesn't pay you and you, you threaten to turn him in or whatever. So it establishes a new way uh, that power operates in these previously sort of more, in these relations that were more directly mediated by personal sort of encounters with, with each other. So that's in the first instance, that's like a way that the, the emerging bourgeois state or capitalist relations production that need a form of government to kind of take hold changes and kind of takes a new form in these ways of regulating sodomy or ways of taking sexuality into itself and turning it into an, a new instance where the state like is a, is a, is a presence in people's lives where it wasn't really before. I don't know if that was actually a direct enough answer at all. Do you think that was good for your question? Yeah, I mean, that's that really breaks it down. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Scott, and you're hearing my chat with Max Fox, editor of Christopher Chitty's posthumously published book, Sexual Hegemony, available via Duke University Press. In a helpful way for me, I mean, the first sort of historical chapter starts there where you're talking about, and like, what the way you explain it shows, it's like the first sort of capture of whatever becomes homosexuality because you're you talked about how it kind of routes the relationship through the state so like you can you ha- can have recourse to this con- concentrated form of power in that in that police force that will like find people and so people then like give up whatever relationship they have between each other to go to this other place to deal with their problems and i think that yeah the way you explained it was really helpful and then the other aspect of it that I think is important in what you were saying is that it becomes a way of trying to mitigate p- potential threat, right? From like the many or the the lower classes. Yeah, there's like this framework of like consent to, to be ruled by getting your like recompense if you like, <laughs> or whatever, it could be like jealous or you're, or something's taken from you or you've been forced into a situation you don't want. But then that also diffuses the possibility of like rebellion um, in some way. I mean, I guess like, so that's like the definition of sort of sexual hegemony and how that helps like work for state power. And, you know, there's like this way that he traces the, um, the kind of the increased politicization of homosexuality to that history of producing the proletariat. So you were talking about the emerging forms of like capitalist production that go from cutting people out of subsistence ways of living, bringing them into wage work, creating these urban centers where people are living different lives and, and working different ways. And he, he often calls that like a kind of surplus population or superfluous. The thing that like, it's really interesting is that there's like the, there's these like cultures of public practices of homosexuality where the men are working together. Mm-hmm. I, I, the thing that really strikes me is how Chitty's argument replays some of the, the like old coordinates of like talking about homosexuality that can either be like a kind of pro gay um, way of thinking or um, a really homophobic way of thinking. So like it, it usually centers around the kind of that superfluousness or uselessness or the non reproductive aspects of, of sex as a form of decadence and disruption of um, like a moral form. And I was just wondering if we can like, is there even a way, are we so inundated with this, like this framework that can we think about sex between men outside of that moral framework? Is it always going to be ambivalent? Like there was a way that like communist uh, parties would say homosexuality was a, was bourgeois decadence. And like, it's true to a certain extent, right? Like Chitty showing us that it's tied to, to that, but it's not. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to no. articulate this. Yeah, yeah. If you want to jump in. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot there. So, uh, th- there's another thing that he's trying to do in this argument, which is to say that this repression that we have come to identify with the meaning of sexuality, of homosexuality or queer sexualities or whatever, deviant sexualities, that's not a necessary feature either of sexuality as such, which is like, maybe that's not exactly what this object of investigation is, or sexuality under capitalism. Because you know, he's a good reader of Foucault. Power is, is productive as well as repressive, right? So, you know, you don't want to have a concept that can only say sexuality is what the state takes from you or something like that or stops you from having. And so he aligns this history of kind of like 
the Aurigian four hegemonic centers of the world system as capitalism kind of expands over the globe. So it goes first from Florence uh, and, and Venice and northern Italy, and it goes to Amsterdam is the next center, then uh, London and then New York. Um, this is the sort of world systems theory according to a Rigi narrative of, of, of capitalist expansion. And Chidi says, okay, let's find out what happens in the moment of transition from one center to the next when the declining center um, is experiencing a crisis or loss of its previous capacity to exert hegemony. So he's saying in these moments of decline, you can find increased repression. And that's actually what the repression means. It's not that capitalism has this kind of like inherently sex negative aspect. It's that it's as a sort of cyclical crisis ridden system um, it's going to have these moments of dissolution that will have, you know, semi-predictable effects. And one of the predictable effects that he asserts is discoverable in the, in the record is that there's this increased attention to male sodomy or men having sex with other men in these moments of, of crisis and dissolution of the hegemonic center. So on the one hand, that's one explanation for this kind of like moral valence, right? So like, Capitalism only notices that sex between men is even happening in this moment when it itself is going through crisis. So, of course, it's going to um, attach a kind of pejorative meaning to it, right? Because it's looking for reasons for its decline. And I think that's, you know, relatively convincing. I, I have to say I'm not, I haven't done this, you know, historical research myself. So perhaps another set of archival material would be able to make a counter argument that says, no, this is actually constant or actually it's like, has nothing to do with the temporality of financial crisis or blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, this seems, this seems compelling to me, but I don't think it's actually necessary for his argument to be true. I think that the point that he's making, so capitalism is characterized by a kind of ceaseless drive to expand and subsume ever more arenas of human social life, right? Like that's, that's observably the case that's theoretically drivable from, you know, Marxist analysis and from, it's a classic tenet of most people on the left. And what that means is that historically, generally what that means is people who are living in non-capitalist parts of the world in basically subsistence forms of social production and reproduction are severed from their capacity to live like this and brought into the circuits of capitalist production. And so a lot of the times that, that has meant then turning them into a kind of like industrial proletariat, putting them to work in factories or on plantations or you know, in kind of sending people to die in armies or settle genocided territories or whatever. But something that that requires is that you have this kind of floating population that's been severed from the means of reproducing their own life at the very beginning. So the, so the premise of capitalist production is a surplus population, right? That, that is sort of not able to meet its own needs for survival without seeking employment on the market, right? Or in kind of non-waged areas, so in the, whatever, in the household internally or in the gray market or uh, whatever. But, um, and so I think one of, the, one of the useful things about Chris and his analysis is that he has a sophisticated enough reading of Marx and of capitalism to sort of dispense with what a lot of the traditional Marxist basically moral positions on work are yeah. and say, you know, it's not good that people are productive. In fact, that's the source of domination. These questions of like, is homosexuality somehow intrinsically related to non-productive modes of living? I think he, he deals with it in a number of different ways. One of which is to say that 
the forms of direct production under capitalism produce homosexuality. You know, like the, the classic form of capitalist production is, and this wasn't always historically the case, but you know, in, in the in the in the fantasy, is the sex segregated factory, right? So a bunch of men who all spend eight, 10, 12 hours a day with another hundred or thousand, whatever, some number of other men, you know, most of them often historically live in dormitories or in workhouse style um, situations. They certainly don't have enough money to start a family, you know, so oftentimes, historically, the only kind of pleasure they're going to find is in each other. Or the, the other sort of like, you know, uh, prototypically capitalist form of, of productive activity is shipping, you know, where you have a same problem, right? And obviously, famously, these are like hotbeds of homoerotic uh, intrigue. And, you know, the same goes for the army, the same goes for, I mean, if you think about the fucking settler colonies, like on the frontier, all the men are either there alone in the wilderness with other in the wilderness, whatever, you know, and, you know, out away from their kind of like, you know, the social world that they were raised in or, yeah, anyway, so it's, it, it's, it's everywhere. Once you, once you start looking at this, you know, and prisons obviously famously are these, you know, it, once, once you impose a kind of sex segregated root norm on the sort of productive social apparatus, which wasn't consistently the case throughout the history of capitalism, certainly, but then, you inevitably have the problem of proletarians are going to have sex with each other. Uh, and, and so anyway, so, so that's one of the sources also of, of this concern for regulating sexuality, regulating homosexuality is because it's a labor discipline question sometimes too. Yeah. I mean, so like this does a few things, right? So like, you know, in the earlier articulations of sexual liberation and also gay liberation, like sexual liberation more generally and gay liberation, there's like that repressive idea that like, there are these forces that are making us not have sex we want. And then gay liberation like had the strategies of trying to find proof of like the naturalness of, of homosexuality throughout history. And, and so like in a way, like what Chitty does is, is expanding on like, you know, Foucault, like you were saying, who says, well, no, the, the homosexuals invented at a certain moment and it's not this eternal, force of like repression and and sexual license or whatever but in another way i think like what what i like so much about what Chitty's doing is like he's saying that we're not asking necessarily the right questions when we are focusing on on these things so like like you said homosexuality as we know it is created by the the development of capitalism but the other thing he keeps f- insisting on uh Chitty is like that it's contingent right and that's i guess the other kind of deviation from like Marx it's like a contingent history it's not necessary that it was this way and so in a way there's like I don't know the ambivalence of homosexuality which is also like is a tool of of rule and a tool of repression it's a medium for us to like find liberation and a way that we're like captured it's like inherent into that in that process and I don't know I mean in, in a way it's like I mean, I've seen this being articulated in various ways, but like, it's like almost like an unresolvable paradox in a way. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Scott, and you're hearing my chat with Max Fox, editor of Christopher Chitty's posthumously published book, Sexual Hegemony, available via Duke University Press. Uh, And so like, I guess like what I'm interested in exploring with you a little bit is like how it shifts the coordinates of like what we think about when we try to like aim for liberation. The way that Chitty, if I can like quote from him, like the way he, he articulates that, and this is a line we, like that you just mentioned to me before we start recording. He says that, I'm quoting, queer would then imply a contradictory process in which norms of gender and sexuality are simultaneously denatured and renaturalized. And that's like the process of sexual hegemony, use, like using sexuality as a rule, a form of ruling. And like the threats are, are often in public sex or cross-class sex. So I was wondering if you want to help me unpack that, like, what, um, if you spent some time on that, like, what does he mean by these norms, um, the sexual hegemony being denatured and renaturalized, and like, what is what are the double side sided process look like? Yeah. So there's another line that I find very helpful that I think might also illustrate this a little bit. 
which is that, oh, I can't remember where, where it is. So I'm going to try and just reproduce it from memory, but it's probably, it's going to be slightly different. Sexuality could only become a problem for a, a society in which biological reproduction was decoupled from uh, the reproduction of ownership. So that, I mean, that, that's maybe this is a little complicated, but it's, it's a historical argument. Uh, which is about the dissolution of the kind of like feudal world where let's say land title is passed down through the family and you know, on, on the kind of like peasant side or whatever. And, and sort of conversely political rule is a hereditary inheritance as well in the aristocratic sense or whatever. In that society, sexuality appears as something that's kind of natural, right? This doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it can't really be an object of anxiety or control in the same way. And historically it wasn't, you know, you had this kind of, I mean, Foucault talks about it, it's like the pastoral power versus the, whatever, the, the medical discourse or whatever, but um, priests could tell you to confess, but like, there's really not a lot of power to like investigate whether or not people's sex was taking place according to the way that you wanted it to be or to punish people for it because you need to it's very hard to you know provide evidence that sexual act took place in the absence of being there you know compelling eyewitness testimony a peasant marriage in feudal times was actually quite limited so anyway so it just wasn't it wasn't a social a floating social problem that needed like regulation the same way that it, that it did once he's saying ownership property private property relations become transferable, alienable, which is the hallmark of capitalist relations of production. So in that sense, sexual norms have become denatured. They once appeared to be organic, natural expressions of the sort of unitary creative world. And now they appear to be an object of uh, political contention and control. And so they're renaturalized um, in this new way by the reimposition of what appears to be necessity of a sort of socially objective meaning that's enforced by you know state repressive apparatus, but as well as the kind of like private mechanisms of coercion and control in the in the workplace and the family. So there's new norms that say you may in the past have been able to like, whatever, like fuck your friends in the field, but now, you know, there's like a different type of threat from the police. And so you become a different, a new kind, a new kind of person. You become a, a your, your nature changes, right? You're suddenly apprehended by the state in a new way. And so it's this, it's this kind of like decomposition of a previously automatic, organic expression of the social order where sex is a kind of meaningless in that it doesn't make a difference whether or not ownership uh, gets transferred in the, norm, in the normal way to something that might disrupt it. And it might disrupt it because there's a new type of person in the world. And that is the sort of like the subject of the sort of hegemonic sexual norm and the deviant person who like fails to be protected by this norm. Does that, does that help? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's so it's like it's interesting because, you know, where we are today, we get stuck on like identity. And it's like it is a it's like the problem that you talked about, like sexual sexuality becoming a problem for statecraft and like state rule is like internalized for us as this problem. Of, like, who am I? And like, how do I how do I figure that out? Yeah. But the, if we trace back those identity terms, they're like police orders or whatever, like that there were forms of like control and criminalization and he he also talks a lot about how like this is a history of policing right so the policing of homosexuality goes hand in hand with the policing of sex work and also the policing of like vagrancy um, sure yeah and so the like the other thing that i think this is like parallel to and, and maybe there's like art, something to articulate here is like yeah within the marxist theory there's like this is another form of like maybe primitive accumulation in the way that like sylvia federici talks about it in Cal caliban and the witch in terms of of how the like gendering of women forms a kind of enclosure around their bodies and sexuality like this is another enclosure which is like an identity type rather than whatever those organic forms are 
that could have existed before. And if you like think about those those previous communities and like maybe even pre-feudal, right? Like it just wasn't a problem or there were other norms in which it was it was like acted out. But like, it's not like, yeah, this this guy sleeps with other men sometimes wasn't like a problem. They're just like, oh yeah, that's a thing that someone does. Yeah. Or yeah, it's just like, that's what men do. They love to have sex with beautiful, uh, you know, people, whatever, as, as long as they're, as long as they're the active partner or whatever, like, oh, like, it's not a, it doesn't, doesn't have bearing on the, necessarily on the social standing of the person doing it. Well, that's the, that's the other thing that I think is in the book that like, because it's not to say that there were like these previous sexual utopias where like men could have sex with other men freely, but they often happened along power lines of like young and old or uh, different classes or like how he talks about the kind of the like workshops where a master and apprentice might have a sexualized relationship, but it wasn't one. It was a discrepancy in power there between the master and the apprentice. So it's not like these were old gay utopias. Or something. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the that's one of the interesting things that he does with this is it's like there's a there's a liberal story. And it can basically take the same material that he's looking at and say like, okay, there was this pre-capitalist utopia for gay people. Somehow, let's say the capitalists decided to chase them out of Eden and pursue them across these centers of financial power um, up until the present, at which point they finally rebelled in Stonewall and now we're free. And that kind of posits, on the one hand, a kind of like a single tradition and identity that was like unbroken uh, somehow across all these social formations Mm -hmm. and one that was like unjustly persecuted and one that would recognize itself in the present as kind of like finally free, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that don't, really hold up about that argument one of them but one of them is that there were these sexual norms that we would now call violent or abusive or or rape you know um that was simply that would that it just simply was how these practices happened you don't have to be like well you know then they really should have been persecuted by the state or like actually was fine because they all really consented at some level or whatever it's just like there is a real heterogeneity to the social practices that doesn't really fit the kind of like triumphant uh, oppressed past liberated future sort of arc. And it also kind of flatters the present and says like, and now we know better. And now like violence doesn't happen in sex. And like, you know, all of our ways of conceiving of pleasure are totally fine for everybody involved. Like, you know, and we don't have any, we don't have any, you know, contradictions that we still need to work out. So he has, he has this kind of like, you know, skeptical view of what was a very, very effective tool for people to win real serious changes in their condition in the present. But like, and, and he's, and he's not, he's not like just saying like, well, it wasn't actually like that. And I'm, I'm here to, speak the truth because I love academic freedom or whatever, but because it's actually, it's like, it's a much more complicated question than we, than we like to imagine. Yeah, totally. Like, I guess speaking just like personally in my relation to the, to this, like, so there's like a kind of double nostalgia that maybe falls into some of that liberal trap. Like when I first read Foucault and the history of sexuality, talking about like, before there was a homosexual, like people weren't, weren't an identity they did things and i was like oh yeah that that makes so much sense that's like liberating me like i don't have to be a thing i could just do whatever i want and like i mean i don't think that Foucault is necessarily saying that but that was how i like first (laughs) received it you know and that kind of connects to like the naive sort of sexual liberation gay liberation discourse that like gay sex queer identity in, in different forms like transness whatever are inherently disruptive and revolutionary and will overthrow capitalism if we can just like fuck whoever we want wherever we want and that was like a line that people took strategically also which is like on maybe on the other side of like the looking for recognition of rights and 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 entry into the power structures of like you know marriage and military etc okay so there's like a nostalgia 
definitely for me for like those moments of gay liberation where like the militancy was also paired with this kind of way of thinking like oh the sex is, like sex our sex is revolutionary and i see that also just like generally today the with like radical queers kind of replaying a lot of those old moments but and then you know with a lot of the academic stuff that tends to be pessimistic about the revolutionary structures never were satisfactory to me but like the way that he argues it that Chitty argues it like does something that like makes me it helps me understand it a little bit more in in a more complex way yeah. than to simply be pessimistic about it although there is like a certainly a pessimistic line in it yeah like one of the ways he phrases it is uh that the ideas of liberation elevate a liberal bourgeois theory of the state into the constitutive principle of human desire and all other cultural formations first of all how does he help us in your in your reading and understanding understand the failures of gay liberation how does it like help us like articulate a new pathway for our liberatory movements starting from the positions of like gay trans queer whatever you want to call different whatever different ones that are sort of loosely linked like how do we go from this critique to like articulating a a movement that really wants to be you know revolutionary and that wants to tear apart these hierarchies and oppression yeah no that's i mean that's the trick right Uh, i mean i think so i think that it's so helpful and refreshing to have someone sort of just say like, here's why this doesn't quite work, you know? Yeah, I, I, I too find it like unbearably romantic to imagine that you know, the sex in the seventies could have somehow like, you know, fucked its way into a utopian alt universe or whatever, you know? It, and, it, and, it, and the only reason it didn't happen was because of AIDS maybe. And like, and that's really, you know, not to, I don't want to sort of, you know, dismiss the gravity of, of, of everything else that people were doing. It was in the context of like pretty widespread, sustained, intense militancy. Um, it wasn't just, just sex or whatever. Right. I'm not, I'm not being so yeah, Stalinist about it, but okay. So I've been, yeah, I've been reading this book that I'm pretty sure uh, Chris was reading throughout early on or whatever by uh, this theorist, Moish Postone, who taught at U Chicago where he did his undergrad. And it's this critique of what he's calling traditional Marxism, traditional theories of Marx that like basically mistake what Marx was doing for giving a critique of capitalism from the perspective of labor so as to say like labor makes capitalism but then capitalists take it away and if we just get rid of the capitalists and keep laboring in the same fashion then we'll have socialism and then everything's gonna be fine and he's like post is like no that's not really what marx was saying marx was saying actually that like because of these the contradictory character of the sort of basic categories of capitalist society um abstract labor, commodity, et cetera, et cetera, abstract time, all kind of, I don't want to get into the details too much, but it basically like, you can't rely on a kind of like simple affirmation of your, the the position that you find yourself in within capital society to kind of like undo the, the, the problem. You need to find a way to to self-abolish basically, right. To kind of like, and not simply, not simply like, you know, just, get rid of everything, but like, um, you know, transform the present such that you're no longer reproducing your own domination. And I think there's a kind of a symmetry in the way that Chris was trying to treat these, these categories around sexuality. Sexuality appears as this potentially a standpoint of critique of sort of straight society or whatever. And you could imagine that all you needed to do was get rid of the straight people who are preventing us from living out the free satisfaction of our desires. And then we'll be able to kind of like, you know, stop upholding the larger capitalist social order that we are convinced. And I kind of agree that your sexuality is like a really integral part of, and that's basically, and it's interesting that that's basically the kind of thesis of the sexual liberation movement, right? It's like our desire is blocked or impeded from its full expression in the social. And what we need is to find a way of removing these barriers to, to its kind of 
full expression and then the problem is going to be over. Um, and that's certainly, you know, to, to critique that position is certainly not to say like, no, it's actually fine. Everything's fine. You're complaining, you're, you know, whining about nothing. Like there's serious, you know, vectors of, of misery and violence. Um, obviously, you know, like it's, you know, still going on much more intensely around gender and trans people right now. But, um, you know, there's, there's, there's obvious enemies to be opposed um, by any kind of liberatory political formation. But the trick is to not, not let yourself be so mesmerized by them that you think that they are the only kind of danger, right? Like the whole of society needs to reproduce itself in a moment um, somehow through the mediation of these categories and our, our movements have to have a kind of delicate enough grasp of what presuppositions we might be affirming when we are working out the kind of horizons that we're going for or the sort of strategies that we adopt or whatever. The Final Straw Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. After the 2016 election, a lot of us woke up to some harsh realities. In the aftermath of dark events, I came back to political work with a new sense of urgency. But after a few months of showing up to protest every weekend, I started to burn out. It didn't feel like anything was changing. In fact, maybe things were even getting worse. And it got me thinking, what comes next? Rebel Steps is a podcast about what comes next. You'll hear episodes on letter writing to political prisoners, practicing mutual aid, and creating political art. You'll hear the voices and stories of my community in New York City, spotlighting a range of organizers from the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, NYC Books Through Bars, Anarchist Black Cross, Lower Manhattan Food Not Bombs, Brand Workers, and more. I'll walk you through what you can do to start plugging into movements and learning organizing skills step by step. If you've been to a march or two and you're looking to jump in, this podcast is for you. Or if you have friends looking for more, pass it on. Listen at rebelsteps.com, on iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Scott, and you're hearing my chat with Max Fox, editor of Christopher Chitty's posthumously published book, Sexual Hegemony, available via Duke University Press. Yeah, that's that brings me that makes me think of this line that really stuck out to me as like it's not something that is expanded upon in the book a lot and it's, it's a place where I like want to keep thinking. And maybe you have some thoughts on it. Where he writes uh, the central contradiction connected with homosexuality and by extension with the category of heterosexuality and social power more generally is that of consent. How various societies have understood consent as the basis of the exercise of power more generally. Uh, yeah, there's. I just think there's a lot contained in there, and 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 also consent is a, a term that's being used a lot within you know our our movements to to, to reframe our thinking around justice and accountability. Um, but I was wondering if you if you had thoughts on unpacking that, like how how could like a queer movement or gay liberation be articulated around this idea of like consent on one hand, power on the other because there's something here about being it's not just like about consent but uh like being kind of pushed into consent to be ruled too i think yeah so that's yeah i find it really uh suggestive and helpful but i'm not positive exactly what he meant i I, i've only been thinking about this example for like an hour or so today so i hope i'm not gonna walk myself into a, a bad position but there's okay so there's this interesting article today in the new york times about it was like about like touch hunger like through the pandemic mm-hmm. and there's this person who's like i did sex work i was like a dominatrix and i really liked it because i was able to kind of like be much more explicit about the type of, of touch and interaction and shit that I was going to get in a sexual situation because like lots of women, I had childhood of socialization to like sort of uh, unwanted touch from all types of people. And this past year of like touch hunger or whatever during the pandemic has really made me reconsider how much I like consented to touch that I didn't want uh, as a sex worker. And I like reached out to all these other sex workers and I asked them about it too. And they were all like, yeah, basically like 
you know, I've consented to like, I didn't, I, yeah, what was, basically, basically like, the thrust of it was like, consent and desire are not the same, you know, like uh, you, you basically, you, you can extract like a sort of misogynist, you know, rape culture can extract consent quite easily from people, whether or not that's, you know, what they want or what's good for their, you know, psychic well-being, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or has anything to do with kind of like social equality, you know, consent, in other words, is like actually a way of reproducing exploitative power relations and, and is an integral part of sort of misogynist world that operates on gender violence. And I don't know, I was reading that and I was like, yeah, so then maybe consent isn't really the the question, is it, right? It's like, if it can be the constant throughout all of these stories of like, not all of them were traumatic, but, you know, shitty times that people had that stayed with them and affected how they continue to operate in the world and access pleasure and things like that. Maybe it's not the sufficient criterion that we are looking for to like have a sexually free world. I think that kind of direction is what he's, he's going towards in this question of like the normative order, current sexual hegemony that we, that we all kind of live in, carry out. Yeah, is a, is a way of kind of like eliciting a kind of like consent at a formal level to this terrifyingly violent world, like consent to be governed by social relations that run on gender violence. You know, like how could you possibly have a, a meaningful, discreet sexual encounter that's separate from that larger context and say yes to that, but like not to the rest or whatever. I think that's kind of the direction he's going in. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of feminist legal thinking around this that I, I unfortunately am not as versed in as I'd like to be, but you know, it's this, it kind of extends this sort of contractual idea that you can freely enter into some kind of relation with an, another person in an unequal society. And sure you can in a practical sense, like, you know, basically it's, it's, it's in fact, it's necessary for the society to operate. You have to have this level of formal equality for its whole concept of legitimation to operate. But if you don't buy the presuppositions of sort of capitalist rule, like you're an anarchist or communist or an anti-authoritarian of some sort, then that's just simply not sufficient to guide your interactions. Looking at these kind of the way these concepts are kind of like just really deeply embedded in our capacity to think about relating to other people, it's tricky. You know, like I, I wouldn't say like we need to get rid of this concept, you know, and just kind of figure it out later. But uh, you know, there's some pretty serious contradictions that are worth following. Yeah. You laid that out in a, a helpful way. Like, so like he, he talks also about like the norms of consent being part of the bourgeois um, development of sexuality, sort of like post world war two, I think in terms of like domestic heterosexual marriage, but yeah. you also connect that to like this sort of myth of like the liberal subject who consents to be governed. And, and that's like what we're kind of taught ideologically of course, that like that moment of consent is always like pushed outside of like our actual experience or, or, or like history. It's like this other time. Also, like going back to that kind of Edenic version of like being ex- like the you know, gays being expelled. So that makes sense to me. And like like sexual identity, then like consent can be used strategically. But if we get caught up in that as the thing itself, then we're stuck in that discourse. And I think that's why I think that's a good way of putting it. But that, but that's interesting, too, to think about in connection to, like, you know, there's, like, consent culture, but then also, like, the kind of abolition movements and transformative justice discourse that goes around. Like, we we often use the word consent to, like, get at those things, but the thing that, like, 
that transformative relations are getting at isn't about articulating consent, but articulating relations that don't operate along those same power differentials, right? Or it's like, if we had to actually theorize consent in this way, it would be infinitesimal, right? Like every moment we'd be having to consent to, and that's like an impossibility in a way. I don't know, I'm also just like kind of going off this, that the way that you kind of unpack the example from that, the sex workers experience, because it's also been something that's critiqued within like BDSM, where they're like, well, it seems this place where consent is made very explicit, but, and yet here are all these examples of like where that can, that explicit consent culture can be abused by people who have various forms of power within that culture. So, yeah, I don't know if you had some thoughts on what I, I was saying there, but. It's making me think of some things that I, I, I don't think I'm capable of reproducing right now. So <laughs> okay, that's fine. I know, I know it's, I know it's like a, it's a rich field of thought and I, I'm just not going to pretend like I can contribute right now. Totally. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I'm just getting excited about it, but like, yeah, that's another conversation perhaps. So there's like a couple more things that if you're, if you're up for it that I, I want to touch on. Like you mentioned the kind of interruption that HIV AIDS yeah. brought to the queer movement. And that, you know, that also like coincided with further dismantling of radical movements like black liberation and indigenous movements. But, the, you know, uh, Chidi's argument has some interesting things to say about how AIDS kind of like replays histories of control of sexuality. So I, I wonder if you wanted to expand any bit any more on like the way the history of disease and epidemics is tied to our understanding of sexuality because like it was like preceded by syphilis and et cetera. Um, yeah, if you had some thoughts on that or just expanding on, on, on AIDS in relation to gay movement. Uh, I, put, I put the finishing, like the final edits on this, excuse me, on the manuscript last like April. It's so, like in the first month of lockdown. Yeah. Um, and I've been working on I've been working on the text. I mean, since he died, since 2015, and I mean, not you know consistently, but I you know I've been sort of going through it at various different levels. And that whole time, I didn't quite catch how central disease was to his narrative um, until this last April. You know, but he's pretty explicit that you know the sort of like preconditions for a modern bourgeois concept of sexuality, a sexually free body, you know, A has to do with the kind of uh, enclosures in the European countryside to bring all these new uprooted ex-peasants to the city, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Establishment of capitalist social relations production, blah, blah, blah. But also you need to have plumbing and you need to have a sort of health infrastructure that can keep people's bodies like relatively clean. Um, And this is the result of successive pandemics. So it doesn't go into a lot of detail about this, but like the the vagrancy laws that are first used to criminalize sodomites in Northern Italy are passed in the aftermath of the Black Death to kind of manage what is this kind of collapsing feudal social order, right? So like the, so the feudal countryside is transformed in the wake of this plague, right? And so all of a sudden these peasants can kind of travel in a different fashion and they need to suddenly compel them to stay in place in the new, in the new way. So they pass all these vagrancy laws. Um, you, can't, you can't be more than a hundred yards from your local town or whatever. And these are, these are the same vagrancy laws that they start using to, to sort of threaten the sodomites with. And secondly, syphilis, the way that it's transported from the new world kind of demonstrates the kind of the new global trade networks and the relations of extraction, domination, and violence that are kind of putting Europe into a new kind of like orientation towards the rest of the rest of the world. And in particular, exposing and it's, it's proletarian populations to all kinds of new bodily conditions, basically. You have syphilis that kind of transforms the needs of the emerging state to kind of manage and have a kind of like sanitary body around um, in cities so it's not spreading pestilence and 
cholera obviously is a similar story. You know, when you have these kind of enormous slums where you've kind of just dumped the factory working for, uh, population, but because they're kind of living on top of each other, they're super liable to spread disease if it shows up. And so all of a sudden you need to invent plumbing and you need to invent, you know, epidemiology and you, whatever, all, you know, all these modern kind of conveniences also go into a kind of reconceptualization of the public sphere so that men are no longer, it's like free to piss on the street, he says. So the story is, you know, bourgeois women start showing up in public once again after centuries of being um, secluded in the household and they're scandalized by all these penises that are everywhere. And so Europe starts putting up these um, urinals, which kind of hide the penises, but obviously also in this dialectical fashion, they kind of concentrate and um, eroticize these, you know, these, what does he call them? Temples of, of urethral eroticism. And so anyway, so it's, it, 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 the, yeah, the point is, is there's this whole thread of kind of like existence of disease as a kind of motor of this sort of social transformation of what sexuality means in this story that he's also telling that I didn't quite grasp for the first like you know, number of years I was working with the text and, and only in the past year did it really hit me. And then he has this whole other story where like, okay, so you have the sexual gay liberationists in the 60s and 70s who are like, we have, we have a glorious past that we need to kind of liberate ourselves and it through us. And then with the arrival of HIV AIDS, all of a sudden the histories that these activists are telling are quite different. They are about the kind of like bodily practices that actually constitute material sort of social reality of what homosexuality is because that is where the virus lives. You know, that's what's salient for them politically and existentially. And it changes the sort of the, the way that they're theorizing about themselves and about history. Um, and so he's like, you know, both of these things are quite valuable contributions to the understanding of sexuality and homosexuality in particular. Now, maybe in 2013 or whatever, the kind of like apocalyptic urgency of the, of the HIV AIDS crisis is um, in the past somewhat. Um, and, and so we can kind of be a little bit more critical or, or uh, um, assess these histories with a bit more distance. And, and we're no longer kind of under this injunction to tell politically helpful stories that will save our lives. And now we can kind of like look at why maybe these presuppositions of the, of the, of the political movements that made these demands, which are quite productive, also in other moments kind of inhibited a total liberation. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Scott, and you're hearing my chat with Max Fox, editor of Christopher Chitty's posthumously published book, Sexual Hegemony, available via Duke University Press. What's well, interesting to think about, like, like Okingem, right, who w- was an early sort of utopian liberationist, although I think he's more complex than, than that, because um, he, he also includes an idea of, like, overcoming homosexuality. Right. But he he was so concerned, and he, you know he you know, he didn't want to disclose his his status or whatever with the HIV because he was worried that it would imperil the like liberationist forms of sex that he had that were so important to his like vision of revolution, which was like you know cruising and and everything. But then that that like that's something that he's been criticized for for like his unwillingness to to avow his like. Yeah. Or that this that paradox of like this sort of sexual liberation and in his situation. But then on the other side I'm thinking like he like kept it separate in a way that is problematic for yeah, it, it puts a limit on his like sort of contribution at that point. That's not really a question, but the other the other side I'm thinking of like this book, like sexual hegemony in a way, like it's it's maybe a weird connection, but maybe this will say something to you. I don't know if you've read read it, but to me it like reads like totally as a companion to Samuel Delaney's Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, where he oh yeah, like he's ri- he's writing in the in the height of like the crisis in New York of HIV AIDS crisis in New York and the way that's used as a political tool to criminalize sexual public sexual activity under like public health measures. Mm-hmm. 
on the still maintaining this like kind of utopian vision of like of a sexuality in the midst of health crisis and the, I, yeah there's like a way that this that chitty is like work kind of really resonates for me with the way that delaney um articul- articulates sexuality and he he even gets these things about consent too because he 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 discusses like masculine violence um as a uh, kind of effect of a false scarcity that's imposed on like sexual availability which like really parallels the idea of like capitalism enforcing sort of false uh, scarcity or creating um, that I, this is not also well thought out I'm just kind of like going here um, in this moment like in the current, current- yeah that's it's that's, that's so funny that you say that I saw yeah I mean, he's definitely, I mean, he cites Delaney a couple of times, I think. Um, he's def- definitely like drawing from it. But it's so funny. I mean, maybe this is just like, I mean, so this was drawn, this was like an adaptation of his PhD thesis. Um, so maybe this is just like how those things go. But um, I've read it so many times. And then I'm like, I'll be reading another book that I like, I know he, Chris also read. And I'm like, oh my God, he's just, this is that argument. Or he's just doing this she's kind of transposing this so like so with oak and gown um and homosexual desire in the first couple of chapters you i reread it and i'm like oh my god that's exactly the that's exactly the form of argument he's doing but then you'll read mario Mielli and you're like oh that's what he's that's what he's writing about and you'll i mean obviously he's like he's giving a direct response to foucault history of sexuality volume one and then you know i'm reading time labor and social domination and it's like oh yeah that's the form of argument he's doing it's and it's like whatever that's that's maybe that's just you know that's like i'm saying uh that's just what a, a phd is you kind of you kind of process all this all this thinking and you generate something that's like mostly digested but still its own new object yeah i mean i think it's very unique also obviously it would be it would be very hard to kind of combine all of those positions and not have something totally new but um yeah the delaney i think because he's like he's like a legit liberationist you know like he's for whatever reason i was going back and reading this article by um one of the one of the members of the glf and you know which is like held up as oh they were that in the past the gay liberationists were radical and now they're assimilationist or whatever like we should be like the glf blah blah blah. and i was reading it and it's like this is super misogynist and transphobic and like really like pretty boring actually it's like you know he wants he wants to go back to like use like some term from byron rather than the alphabet soup that current radicals have and just like okay man like sorry that you got annoyed by some kids but uh delaney is like very much I mean, I'm sure he has, he has some weird cranky positions too, but <laughs> at least in terms of his like sexual politics, like about the sex that he has and the sex that he writes about and puts in, in circulation. I mean, he's just like, he's just a freak, you know? And he's like, I'm here to experience pleasure in all types of bodies and write all about it. And uh, I, I like, I understand the sort of like social and political dynamics that are flowing through the bodies in this moment. And it has a lot to do with, you know, capitalist development and like, that's, that is such a valuable tradition and not one that is always found in the kind of like more properly political legacy works or whatever, you know, I guess I didn't, I, yeah, I don't think I, I don't remember what the, the like the precise address of the question was. But. I didn't really articulate a question. I was just kind of like trying to put some pieces together, but that actually helped me. Cause like, I think what, why I went reached for Delaney after talking about like the interruption that HIV AIDS brought into the liberation movement is that he is still able, like he, you know, he writes in the eighties about like the work that was being done for like around care and support and health. Um, But he also is able within that moment to still envision liberationist politics and sex as connected. And perhaps like part of it's like his fiction, that he's a fiction writer, but he like, he, I don't know in a way like he can he can go in the places that like like I also the things that I like about Okingem is that he like ultimately doesn't want to hold on to any of these these categories and that's why he upsets people <laughs> um, who want to find yeah. liberation through these categories and then and that's also what Chitty says 
ultimately and maybe this is where we can like like kind of bring this to the current moment like it's like the argument ends up there's a pessimism that's like okay like liberation isn't going to be just gay because the gay identity is a product of capitalism and we've known that for a while but we but he i think articulates that in a new way that allows us to get more the complexity of it so i don't know i guess like to kind of like get to a a sort of like final question of like like if the problem of queerness is created by the development of the modern state right then then maybe we can't reach liberation or maybe like i i think this we can't reach liberation without also overthrowing the state so then what like the question i keep coming back to and i don't think this has, has to be pessimistic or nihilistic is like what's left for gay liberation or queer radical queer movement does it need to be called that or another way maybe of putting it is like where do we find points of solidarity that can keep like delinking gay liberation from identity and interiority um but open places to like work together because like the power effects that chitty traces historically happened to other people that wouldn't identify as gay too right um so i don't yeah i mean my my basic question is like where do you think like this leaves us who who are radicals fighting you know, radical queers who, who are also fighting for liberation? Yeah, that's a hard question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer, like, practically, or pragmatically. I think that, I mean, because I think we're in a really weird moment, you know, I think that we're living through some type of transition between, let's say, oh, I don't know, a historical period. I, I mean, I would you wouldn't want to make a prediction about an epochal change from inside of it. But it, it certainly seems as if the kind of, and you were talking about this a little bit earlier, the, the kind of like social order that being gay or being queer was like, a, was dissident to is kind of defunct, right? And, and, you know, there's different, there's a number of different ways you can characterize that. It has, I'll, you know, some people like to call it Fordism. Some people like to call it kind of like the classical sort of like, you know, post-war capitalist period where social reproduction is kind of like privatized in the hetero family. Um, and that's, that's been in kind of a bit of crisis for the past uh, 40 years now or more, right? You know, it was like 50 years since Stonewall a couple of years ago. And it's obviously like, uh, you know, a crisis that lasts that long, like maybe you don't call it a crisis after a certain point, um, you just call it a new sort of period. So there have been ways of stabilizing social reproduction, even though that type of family organization is no longer hegemonic. But then that means that it, because it's not hegemonic, maybe it wasn't a necessary feature of this particular order of capitalism like social reproduction still takes place, um, even if it's like, you know, largely mediated by the market or um, debt financed or, uh, you know, uh, even kind of um, affected through like queer forms of chosen family or distributed sort of community care models or whatever. I think that what is useful about the kind of like political position of, of, of queerness being the inheritor of, a tradition of like really serious attempts at grasping like how these different orders of social reality connect and reproduce each other. Um, Because, you know, it's really easy to say like, oh, sex has nothing to do with the economy, real material productive activity. Or on the other hand, it's easy to say like, oh, it's just like a kind of mechanical expression of class, belonging and that gives and that gets you to kind of fucked up positions of you know proletarians aren't queer and then therefore it's like bourgeois to like give a shit about pleasure it's just not that's just never been historically the case so there is a really powerful and valuable like tradition of thinking that has been handed down to us i suppose Um, at great cost, you know, like against like serious genocidal peril for multiple generations. But the, we're in this ambivalent position where it's like the object of that 
tradition of critique has, has transformed in ways that it didn't totally foresee, which is in some ways great because then it's like, okay, so some of the real horrible shit is taken care of or like no longer as, as urgent. And in other ways, it means that we need to kind of rework those traditions and presuppositions and what, what we inherit in a way that's kind of faithful to them, but still kind of gives us a way out of the present because we still need to get out. And I think, okay, in particular, sorry, that was a long way to say, I think in particular, one of the, one of the useful things that there is still on offer in a kind of like queer movement is this ability, is this repertoire that we've developed of grasping how what appear to be natural or extra economic forms of social existence that that have a kind of objective or necessary or compulsory character right you don't choose whether or not you have a sexuality you just you you are you choose whether or not to kind of live it out or express it in a particular way but it's simply that's you know it's like in the, in the social world that we live in it's given to you and uh and there's all types of ways of that that that, that like evolves you know like you now there's a but a, an interesting confirmation of this sort of objective nature you know whether or not we whether or not you want it is the kind of the, the larger kind of political activity around asexuality right or it's like this is a this is a type of um, identity position that like is clearly real and meaningful and valid in exactly the same ways as, as you know all the other kind of like whatever say allosexual identities but it, it doesn't negate the existence of having a sexuality as a kind of imperative, as a social sort of unavoidable fact. And um, in fact, it confirms it in this kind of negative way. And so a queer movement would be one that is capable of grasping these imperatives as intimately related to questions of liberation, solving these imperatives politically through some type of collective struggle means investigating why they take the form that they do in this particular society with this set of compulsory socially objective relations and not just saying like oh it's natural or oh you just want to do this because i feel like it or you know oh it's it's socially constructed or whatever so that you know we just need to kind of like tell enough people not to do this in this way so that we can get out of it. It's like, no, it's actually probably going to take, and obviously like, you know, some, some level of, of, of that tactic is successful. You know, it's necessary uh, to, to, um, to any kind of social movement. Unfortunately, you have to kind of like do the really thankless work of yelling at people or bothering them about stuff that they think is like, you know, the reflex, but, but there's also a different level that it exists on. And we need, we need to have a kind of way of grasping that. And that, I, you know, that's not at all a concrete answer, but I think that's like the kind of like the sort of precious insight or tradition or whatever in the queer liberatory lineage that I think is like still useful. This is The Final Straw and I'm Scott and you're hearing my chat with Max Fox, editor of Christopher Chitty's posthumously published book, Sexual Hegemony, available via Duke University Press. Since we're forming our discussion around this book, if like what this book does is historicize the history of sexuality. I think that's something he says. Like, I'm thinking about how Okingen talks about, like, the leftists are always fighting the last revolution. And, like, if we get caught up in the conditions that produced gay liberation, which was, like, according to Chitty, the policing of sexuality that led to confrontation, like, fighting police in the streets, which was, like, led to Stonewall. Um, you know, like, if we're fighting that, that war now, like, well, that's the wrong war because you know, homosexuality has been included, it's no longer a threat. And it's not the like node of, of control in the same way. It is in other places, I guess, like, particularly like around uh, transness and right now it's being articulated. But the other thing, like this book doesn't give us a predictive thing, obviously a predictive uh, tool. But since he ar- articulates all these moments around these times of financialization, like we're in that moment, right? We're in a time of like sexual hegemony, potentially mm-hmm. changing. So that that term can give us something to think about the way sexuality is politicized not as like like a simple dynamic 
of like yes or no or you know repressed or liberated but like it's a subtle tool that we need to kind of like try to understand how to wield for ourselves and not for the state but like yeah i I guess we're still inundated with all those slogans that are so intoxicating from from that time when there was like way more visible militancy you know and the social war was visible, right? Like it, a lot more, or like, like generally visible at that time. So yeah, people taking up arms in a different way. Yeah, and shit. It's just yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like get left in this pessimistic place of gay liberation has been totally captured, but and but that's like also an old story, and then still like a thing about how the new articulations of queerness are are potential locations of solidarity. Um, and like seeing the work that like Pinko does too, in terms of the the way that the journal kind of brings together different fronts, I think is is helpful to think through those kinds of modes. You know, like yeah, there's a lot in. I think it's it, I think it's expansive, right? Like the like you in the two volumes, it, it brings together different movement work on different fronts, right? There's stuff around sex work there's stuff the like trans history project there's like theories of, of sexuality um there's a mix of old discourse right like reprinted texts from yeah, yeah. the old movement there's like new takes on things i don't know i think i, I like that because it's it's like a it's still it's like seeing it as a coalitional politics oh yeah interesting sure Actually, yeah that's nice that is nice to to think about it like that yeah i mean with pinko we're de- we're one of, one of the one of the fantasies that i had when I started started working on it was that we would have a kind of, yeah, venue for bringing together a bunch of different perspectives that don't, that hadn't really been a conversation, but also kind of like hopefully trying to consolidate what might be a new position that I don't know that we have yet. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm sure that it like, it reads differently from the other side, you know, it's more, maybe more coherent or more like, all in sync or whatever but um the other thing that i i thought would be important to have a magazine or a kind of a, a, some kind of a record going was of these struggles around sexuality as the current dominant hegemonic mode begins to sort of transform um i thought it would be useful to have a, a kind of like a place that was like attending to the different ways that people are trying to work out what it, what it means to be militant with these problems or these concepts or whatever, you know, and one, and I, mean, I think one of the, one of the, one of my favorite pieces was from the first issue. And I, I don't know, I feel like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to say this in a, in a kind of like too simple way, but it was the interview with, with these, these two trans people who went down to a, like a coal uh, ship, a coal train uh, blockade in Kentucky, um, I think. Um, and they like set up a kind of like, you know, a classic like encampment style protest occupation thing that like uh, has been a really dominant form for a lot of types of protests for the past decade or so. And we like had this interesting conversation with them while they were, you know, there at the camp and they had this, you know, very hopeful kind of like, we're here to support the miners, but we're also like, you know, members of the community were from Appalachia. And, like, you know, obviously there's like some, maybe there's some tension around our transness or whatever, but like, you know, we're able to talk with them in a kind of like chill way and resolve this conflict. And like when it came, when it came to us, it was like this cool, story about like precisely that like this coalitional thing where it's like wow trans struggles and you know uh, the classical worker militancy thing can come together in these like wildcat places where they block circulation and it's this perfect you know illustration of so many political trends like we'd love this fusion and then like actually what ended up happening was like in the in between the like the interview that we did and like the publication of the of the magazine, some like Trump dudes showed up 
basically and like took over the camp or like installed themselves in the camp and the miners like basically weren't able to reestablish their own control and so like the trans people are like this is like not a chill place for us to be and we can't trust you dudes to like kick out this fucking like weird biker gang or whatever so we're leaving which is a reasonable thing to do anyway it's so so we ended up having to like run this kind of like long intro paragraph about like why they didn't quite work and like why you know what they thought was the fishers in their previous assessment that you know they'd, they'd been able to do this interesting coalitional thing and like i i don't know yeah i, I don't want to tell this story like haha they were proved wrong or whatever um, but i i thought having the space to kind of like investigate there's quite a lot to be learned in figuring out the limits also of these forms of political action and political sort of conduct and protest and thinking and i was glad that we had this like venue where we weren't like oh we have to we have to give a kind of like posy story about you know the like powerful moment of unity between the like you know macho minor dudes and these like less macho trans people or whatever it was it wasn't a kind of like affirmative thing like it, what was interesting was that like we could actually take the time to like take apart why these why this in particular this one thing didn't work because obviously like that's going to happen much more than winning you know <laughs> and so like there's a lot you know figuring out how to like think about how things come apart and what to do with that and what to learn about that is what i find interesting about the potential for this for pinko that makes sense and that that's sort of like with the kind of crisis theories or like or we look at the sort of moments of crisis as potential openings for something even though all the past moments haven't been moments of like winning they're like moments of loosening where other things can happen and that's i don't know I'm, that's where i i'm at right now is that like instead of thinking about that punctual moment to like look at the places where it's where things are being done differently in the present and work from there i don't know if it's like yeah aggregate or, or what but um but yeah, like like we can't tell these deterministic histories, which are like kind of used both in like liberationist theories and repressive theories, you know? Mm, yeah, totally. Well, we've been talking for a while, so I don't know if there's like any final thing that you kind of want to touch on. Is there any where you want to like direct people to to find your work? Other, I mean, read Sexual Hegemony. That's put out by Duke University Press. Yeah, you guys should, yeah read that. Exactly. Yeah, go find that on the, I mean, the Duke website uh, is a good place to buy it from. I'll put in a plug, the Duke press, the people who work there are unionizing, so you better support them if you have any kind of interaction with Duke. You know, maybe if you buy the book, you should add a note saying recognize the union or whatever you find is effective about those things. I saw your name. I signed today on their author support letter. and saw your, your name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, that's funny. Uh, I, you probably can't buy, I think, it, if if you want to buy the, the Okingam translation that I did, I think, like, I will personally have to fulfill it because the publisher um, is in sailing on a boat in the Arctic now, and she, like, dropped off all the remaining copies that are in my closet. So if you really want to order a copy, I guess I can put that in the mail, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on that being like a prompt delivery. Um, and then Pinko, you can find it at pinko.online. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking all the time to talk yeah. and share thank, these ideas. Thank you so much for asking such interesting questions. I, I hope it was coherent. <laughs> I, said. I think you did a really good job, like ex- sort of explaining the main ideas of the book also in a way that like helped me think about it. Like, Cause I've read the book and probably a lot of people listening won't have read it, but so like, yeah, you brought out new aspects of it for me. And I thought, I think it was really clear. And then, yeah. <laughs> And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say?
we all just get along? It seems that in the practical world, the answer is a resounding no. Particularly during the zombie apocalypse, communities and collectives are sometimes spraying, sometimes breaking up or dissolving. It makes sense in one respect at least. When we all have our daily routines, we expend our time and energy in a variety of locations with a variety of different people. When we're all locked down for a year, we spend our time with the same people day in and day out. We get tired of seeing their faces and hearing their voices. Our worlds get smaller and smaller. And as our worlds get smaller and smaller, the little annoyances that our friends and loved ones commit get bigger and bigger. What wasn't even noticeable before COVID, watching westerns on TV with the volume too loud, or chewing with a mouth open, or not cleaning up the spilled bong water on a comforter, makes you want to murder somebody. Hair in the shower drain becomes a capital offense. We're all a bit more on edge, a little more short-tempered. We're the products of slow-roasted trauma with no real end in sight, stuck in each other's stupid faces, breathing each other's recycled parts. On top of that, we might have some real disagreements, valid ones, even related to the COVID crisis itself. You might have folks who live together in the same squad, who have fundamentally different ideas on how to navigate this pandemic. You might have someone who works a service industry job and needs the income for meds, while someone else in the same house helps a sibling who is immune system compromised in some way and resents their housemate rolling the dice by going in to work each day. There's the question of who is allowed to come over to the house and who gets to stay over and what precautions those guests can be expected to take in order to qualify. These are much more subtle questions than whether we should have a house party or whether we shouldn't. It's a question of, should I help out at Food Not Bombs when lots of people are really needing help, or should I feel guilty about putting your grandmother at risk and then stay home? Or should you stop shopping for your grandmother and get your brother to do it so I can continue volunteering with Food Not Bombs? These aren't easy questions to answer. These are not the clear-cut kinds of scenarios where somebody is the good guy and somebody is the bad guy. These are situations where everyone understandably wants to keep living and maintaining a reasonable quality of life. It's the scenario that's the bad guy, turning us on each other like Donner Party survivors, fighting over who we eat next. Just a quick digression here. But I have it on good authority from a cannibal I know. We used to play chess. That we taste like chicken. A little greasier. Anyway, in just a figurative way, not in a literal way like my former chess opponent, we've begun eating each other. In some instances, we turn on each other because we're the only ones there. Sometimes we have legitimate issues. And so do they. So the questions arise. To what degree... Do we have the right to regulate each other? In what ways do I have a right to tell you that you're wrong and how you navigate this zombie apocalypse? What expectations should I have related to how you take precautions or don't take them? And what do we do? Do we set rules and demand compliance and enforce them and insist punishments on those who break them? If so... At what point do we put on uniforms and badges and hate ourselves? Those are some practical questions in this brave new world that confronts us. So, some thoughts. As someone who has had to live cooped up with people I can't stand day after day, maybe year after year, I can tell you that a lot can be mitigated just by our attitudes. For me, the principal question related to the person with whom I share living space isn't whether I like him or I don't like him. Liking a cellmate is a luxury. The question is, can I work with him? If I can't work with him, can I work around him? And if I can't work around them, can I get rid of them? When those who are close to me get on my nerves and do something that disappoints me, I try to remind myself of some of the good things that they've done and how they don't really owe me anything. My good fortune to have good people in my life who matter to me 
even if they are sometimes cranky, or demanding, or sloppy, or thoughtless. I try to imagine all the things those people put up with for me. I make lists in my head. I know, you may find this hard to believe, but sometimes I'm slightly less than perfect. No, really, I am. And so, those exercises make the really insufferable just a bit more tolerable. Just a bit. But in those instances when you have a major disagreement and you're thinking about what ground rules need to be set and how to enforce them, whatever the numbers are, majority to minority, even if it's everyone against one, if you've gotten to that point where you're setting rules, you've already jumped the proverbial shark. If you and I are living in the same community, I don't have to demand a rule that you don't shit in my pillowcase. I'm not saying it's okay to shit in my pillowcase. I'm saying that if I have to ask you to stop shitting in my pillowcase, our collective community is already on the endangered list. If we belong in the same family or tribe or community, much of our cooperation and collaboration should go unspoken and be largely unconscious, choreographed by our common respect and concern for one another, not by rules. It should be like the water that fish swim in, something we don't even necessarily see. If we have to work to stay out of each other's way, if we're constantly offended by the proverbial turds we're finding in our pillowcases, then maybe that's an indication that we have outgrown the relationship we have. Maybe we're better apart. In that sense, perhaps COVID has only hit the fast forward on a lot of situations that were going to end eventually anyway. That's not necessarily a bad thing. The Jonas Brothers broke up. So did One Direction. I think we're all relieved. So, it's not the end of the world that maybe you call it quits on some relationships or situations that are just no longer satisfying, rather than trying to overmanage each other. Endings are not always a bad thing. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain, an exile from Ohio at Buckingham Correctional in Dillwyn, Virginia. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain by addressing letters to Sean Swain, number 201-5638, Buckingham Correctional Center, P.O. Box 630, Dillwyn, Virginia, 23936. He has a book that is available from Little Black Cart Distro. His zines can be found online at theanarchistlibrary.org. And other of his writings and updates are still available at swainrocks.org. Sean has a complaint pending before the Inter-American Human Rights Commission for the torture that he suffered at the hands of the state of Ohio. He is also collecting letters of support for his bid for clemency. You can find more details on Instagram by following Swainiac1969. You can find his past writings recordings of his audio segments and updates on his case at seanswain.org or now follow him on twitter at at swain rocks just a little addendum to last week's discussion with pranav jeevan p we've gotten good feedback about it i'm glad people have appreciated it so there were some solidarity options at the beginning of the chat that my co-host put in which are i'm sure still available and super helpful and Another way that people can provide solidarity to uh, people that are suffering from this latest COVID wave in India and, you know, as it ravages across parts of Africa and Latin America uh, is to approach the concept of medical copyrights and to challenge those. The fact is that even though the U.S. where we record this has a new administration, that administration has not yet lifted the limitations on distribution not only distribution um which is a charitable act but distribution of vaccines to other countries um but more importantly has done nothing but protect the companies that developed these vaccines that are still kind of in testing phase uh based off of well let's let's talk about knowledge development right so the scientific knowledge that our species works off of and builds off of is actually collaborative. It, you know, copyright laws, capitalist attempts to uh, 
encapsulate work and pay people for work, which I want people, I want, you know, doctors and researchers to get fed to. But um, all of this works off of a presumption that they're not, that they're working in a bubble and that they are the progenitors of the knowledge that they're working with. And point of fact, they actually are building off of millennia of knowledge that has been accumulated throughout our species that was never copywritten up until this point. That's the work of dead generations um, so that new generations might live um, and to better their circumstances while they were alive. And for as long as there have been medical copyrights, uh, there's been this sort of imperialism where countries that have more guns um, and thus have generally more resources because they've taken resources from other places have the ability to concentrate and withhold you know, developments that they've made. But again, not developments that they've made in a bubble. So one way of approaching besides sending resources, which is amazing, would be to work to challenge the framework that allows for the West to copyright and hold these patents on vaccine materials. Um, the more people that can develop and test and then produce vaccines around the world, the less the cost will be. And also keep in mind that these companies in the West that have been developing the vaccines, not, not all the vaccines, Cuba developed one, Russia developed one, other countries have developed vaccines, but these vaccines have been subsidized very, very highly by taxpayer money. Uh, and yet in the normal, normal standard way that the medical industry works, the developers who go through the process and have gotten these government grants in order to develop it get to hold on to the patent for a period of time and uplift the price. Now, I could see where in some circumstance, like you've developed a new form of ibuprofen that's slightly different from the existing ibuprofen. Okay, well, everyone's got the regular ibuprofen. Hopefully that would sustain most people. It's not the worst thing in the world if somebody's holding a patent on it for a while but this is like we're in the middle of a, the um beginning of the second year of our uh global pandemic with COVID-19 and th this is totally unreasonable that certain countries would withhold or allow their companies to withhold the patents uh at their behest so take that as you will put pressure where you think you need to um, discuss this, debate it, research it. Uh, but yeah, the medical industry and the way that capitalism engages and imperialism engaged through it is utterly unacceptable. And um, that's another point of pressure that we can do to act in solidarity with people in India who are going through the second wave, uh, as well as like this is the way, this is like a point of pressure that during the anti globe movement, people were applying pressure around. Um, treatments for AIDS and HIV, again in, in India and in sub-Saharan Africa, where the medications were expensive if available there, um, because they were being withheld by Western companies that had taken tax money in order to produce it. Um, yeah, so just a just a little, just a little uh, seed out into the universe. Thanks for letting let me rant. If you appreciate the work that we do on the Final Straw and you want to support us monetarily we appreciate support it we're honestly still working towards being fully sustainable with our monthly transcription project we've got a couple people that are given a lot of money which is very kind but it would be nice to distribute that into like smaller donations for more people in case those people have to back off um or change the amount of money that they're donating so uh if you like again the conversations you're hearing we're always going to provide it for free, but if you like the transcription, that costs money, and it is available for free once we do produce it. It's up on our website, and you can find it at tfsr.wtf slash zines, and if you want to find out about ways that you can support us monetarily through one-time or recurring donations, some cases in which you're getting merch in exchange for it, which yeah, we love, I make I love making sticker packs and sending them out, for instance. You can find out more about that at tfsr.wtf slash support.
If you want to hear us on your local radio station, check out tfsr.wtf slash radio, and there's more information there. We're happy with the idea of trying to get up on more radio stations and present these conversations to wider audiences. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.